Uh, so quick show of hands, who here already knows what Kubernetes is? Okay, vast majority, that's what I assumed, so you're not getting any of what Kubernetes is, I'm just jumping right in. Uh, so uh, as I was introduced, I am a product manager here at Google Cloud, focused on our open source uh, data and analytics space. And I'm super excited to be at this conference because Google, we have a long history of solving these data problems with the open source community, especially with the Apache community. This goes all the way back to the original MapReduce paper that we put out there that the community and Yahoo took, implemented, and became Apache Hadoop. More recently, we've put out entire software stacks for things like big data processing with Beam or TensorFlow for machine learning. And on the flip side of that, we also now have Google Cloud which gives you the ability to run a lot of these open source software stacks without having to deal with the underlying infrastructure components, hard drives, servers, networking, all that you can pretty much abstract away and just hand us the software. So some very quick examples of what I'm talking about here is if you want to give us a TensorFlow machine learning model and we will host that for you we will right size all of the appropriate uh, infrastructure to do the model training, and you can hand that off to Cloud ML Engine. For pre processing, a lot of time for those same machine learning pipelines, we have Apache Beam, which helps you with both streaming and batch analytics. You can send us your Java code, and without having to deal with any servers, we will just run that for you. Recently, through an acquisition, we've started working with. Uh, CASC or CDAP. Again, open source software. What this is, it's a full GUI ETL where you can take you know, an advanced Kafka pipe, split that up, start sending it to RDBMSs various places without ever having to write a line of code. And the managed version of that, again, Cloud Data Fusion. And finally, probably something a lot of you are familiar with, workflow orchestration with Apache Airflow. If you want to just hand off that DAG of jobs to us and we'll take care of all the open source maintenance, all of the server infrastructure, that's Cloud Composer. I'm personally from our Cloud Data Proc team. Our elevator pitch here is a pat managed Hadoop and Apache Spark. Reality is that it's really this open source ecosystem, I call it like an open source engine for running all sorts of various open source software. And you might be looking at these logos and even thinking right now, you know, Google Cloud, we offer a managed version of some of this, you know, these same open source icons. So we have Cloud Bigtable, a managed NoSQL database. But if your preference is just to run Apache HBase, our team is here, uh, our mission is to really help you just have the best open source experience regardless. Now, most of our team's focus has been on Yarn. Yet another resource negotiator. This is a resource negotiator for big data put out under Apache Hadoop. We're going on, we're coming up on 10 years pretty soon of this, so pretty battle tested. And what the cloud data proc service provides is we have a back end control plane that will take a look at a lot of this yarn management. We'll make sure that your jobs are actually getting completed, clusters are getting torn down, and you know, the jobs are um, resourced appropriately. But yarn it has some pretty significant pain points. First off, the management can be pretty difficult because Yarn, it originally was developed for on-prem bare metal servers. And so we've ported it to VMs and that's helped a little bit, but it's still a pretty loaded stack. So you might find yourself with a lot of open source components that have taken dependencies on other open source components you weren't really expecting. So you go to run some Spark SQL jobs, and then all of a sudden you, know, you have some weird hive dependency, things like that. And that really just complicates this open source stack. And if, like, there's just a lot of versions and dependency management you'll have to deal with in a typical Yarn-based cluster. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, go ask your Hadoop admin who's had to like, install the newest version of Zeppelin. All of a sudden, like a butterfly flaps its wings, you've just stepped on some Java class path and, path, and like every Spark job breaks. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. And then finally, you know, because of all these dependencies, isolation, it gets really hard. So what folks tend to do when they move from on-prem to the cloud with these big data stacks 
is they start to piece up all of the different workloads to run those on an appropriate size cluster, or a sh appropriate size and shape, really. So you might have a lot of BI, or reporting applications, that you'll try to stick onto a memory-heavy cluster. Or you'll have a bunch of machine learning jobs that you'll stick onto these compute-heavy clusters. But piecing all that up and figuring those out and like what jobs align with each other, that can be a pretty difficult task. So this is why Google, along with the open source community, we worked to bring uh, Kubernetes as another scheduler for Apache Spark. Now, uh, this is definitely done with a lot of the community, and so now with Apache Spark, you can run as a scheduler Yarn, Mesos, standalone mode, or Kubernetes, which is now experimental. And this hopefully is going to give you some pretty big benefits. First of all, it's going to give you this unified resource management layer. What I mean here is a lot of uh, customers that at least I work with, they are trying to move all their web applications, all their business applications into Kubernetes, have one cluster management system that you know, train people up on. But then they have this kind of silo big data cluster that's still running Yarn, and they want to get away from that and start running the rest of their Apache big data software in that same Kubernetes cluster. And as they do that, they definitely want to isolate a lot of these open source jobs. So instead of running various different jobs with different dependencies and conflicting with each other on a single cluster, you know, take a lot of those dependencies, a lot of that version, stick those into a container, and then you can just be running you know, two different versions of Spark on the same underlying uh, cluster, and it's fine. You don't have to go back and upgrade you know, one version of Spark just because you know, some data scientist says, hey, I need this new version, this new feature. And that really is going to lead to more resilient infrastructure where you don't necessarily have to be, uh, um, where you can basically be installing you know, the latest security patches on the infrastructure itself and not have to worry about going back and manipulating all these old uh, uh, jobs. So here at Google, this is the way we're approaching big data Kubernetes applications. I call it kind of our good, better, best approach. So we are directly working with the open source community as much as we can to provide a self-managed version where we're taking a lot of these uh, Apache or just open source big data applications and making them more cloud or more Kubernetes native and giving that back for folks to use wherever. But then if you want to abstract away a lot of that infrastructure, kind of how I showed you in like our first couple slides with the management that we provide, that's where something like a cloud data proc would come in on top of that uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. And then there's what I call kind of our best option, which is all the Docker containers that we have for uh, Cloud Data Proc. We're open sourcing those for, uh, for customers, but as well as our partners that might want to extend that abstraction of infrastructure. So that way, you know, a lot of these open source uh, partners that we have that offer <coughs> uh, focus on a particular software stack they don't have to get hung up on doing a bunch of cloud integrations, dealing with security and logging and basic API calls. They can just build on top of the uh, Cloud Data Proc Docker containers, essentially get all that built in, and then really focus on just the open source software stack itself and managing that for their customers, providing the great you know, service level agreements, all of that. Now, the way we're making this happen is via Kubernetes operators. If you don't know what that is, that's essentially an application control plane for running these really complex applications in Kubernetes. It's really an opinionated way that Google is going to provide for doing a lot of this stuff. So it takes a lot of the knowledge that Google has of running these applica data applications for years and then stick those into a very just Kubernetes architecture. Here you go, spin it up, and then you have that you know, Google provisioned infrastructure in Kubernetes. This is done through extending some functionality that Kubernetes already has, where you get a custom resource definition, meaning you can extend the language of Kubernetes to make Kubernetes actually look and feel a lot more like that actual application that you're trying to run. So you don't have to understand all the nuances or details of Kubernetes. You can work with something like Spark how you'd expect to work with Spark. So our first venture into this was with the release of a uh, Spark Kubernetes operator 
That is the GitHub link. Uh, we've been working with some other big companies on this. Both Microsoft and IBM have collaborated with us here. And this just gives you a lot of that basic setup for running Spark applications along with some cloud integrations. Things like direct access to BigQuery, our serverless data warehouse storage, or a replacement for HDFS with cloud storage. So with a simple prefix change in your code, going from HDFS to GS, you can have you know, cloud storage made available to you. There's also integration with logging and some functionality. Again, this is that custom resource definition of Spark Control, where it lets you do some pretty uh, uh, clever things. Like you'd be working locally, and you have all these packages that are on your local laptop. And then when you're ready to send those up to Kubernetes, the Spark Control will help you package all that and ship that off. There's a couple ways to go and deploy this. If you're in Google Cloud itself, what you can do is you can come into the console and search our marketplace for Spark Operator, and you'll find a, a deployment option available where you can click Next a couple times, and now you're up and running a Kubernetes cluster, or you've just deployed that operator into Kubernetes. But you don't want to be in Google Cloud. That's totally fine by us. We also offer a Helm chart. If you don't know what that is, think of basically like an app to get for Kubernetes. And you can take that same operator with all the Google you know, architecture patterns, best practices, and deploy that in AWS, on-prem, wherever you want to go with it. So Spark was the first one of these operators we put out there, but it's not going to be the last. Just last week, we open sourced our operator for Flink, which again is going to give the control plane best practices for running Flink in the cloud with Kubernetes. OK, so you all just got the sales pitch and you know, strategy for what we're doing at Google Cloud. But in the last couple minutes here, I just want to give a quick kind of realistic expectations and things to think about as you're making this transition from Yarn to Kubernetes. Because Yarn has been out there for almost a decade. It's definitely battle tested. It's production ready. And so it's probably not going to be an easy flip of the switch to just to move over to Kubernetes. So just a couple things to think about. Uh, and I'm going to compare these into like, OK, what's good, what's bad? Give you the yin and the yang here of going from Yarn to Kubernetes. So first of all, Kubernetes is going to give you that unified interface if you are already moving to this Kubernetes world, if you already have applications that are running in Kubernetes. But if you're all on OpenStack already, this might just feel like yet another cluster type to manage if you're not already investing in that Kubernetes ecosystem. It's going to let your data scientists and developers tap into a lot of unused Kubernetes resources. So maybe you have all of your web applications, your business applications running in Kubernetes. Nine to five, that server's cranking, it's busy. But then after five, load gets loosened up. You can start sending your big data applications to that same hardware and make use of that processing. The flip side of that is if you've tried to do a lot of that already, with yarn tuning, meaning you know, setting up your yarn queue, using yarn labels to track what's what, that's all going to get thrown out as you move to Kubernetes, just because Kubernetes just has a different way that you're going to manage resources. Developers, they are going to love Kubernetes because they can start to put in all this custom configuration. Even if they want to rip out the, like, what the base operating system looks like and bring in their own container to do that, they can do that. But with that, you definitely want to track what they're actually doing. And so Yarn, this was, I don't know if it was easy, but it's definitely, we know how to do it now. The audit logs tend to be in two places, one for the resource manager, one for the node manager. And at this point, most companies know exactly what those logs look like, what to look for, what to alert on. Kubernetes, we definitely have logging uh, that we're pulling in and integration with cloud logging. But you're going to have to rethink you know, what those logs actually look like. With Kubernetes, you can start to get away from having to like administer an entire Conda environment to keep track of all the different various configurations. See, this is going to allow for really more targeted upgrades because you can package exactly the functionality you want into a particular Docker container associated with that job. So everybody might be on an older version of Spark that's production tested. You have one data scientist that says, ah, I really want this new feature in the latest version of Spark. They can package that in the container, run it on all the same infrastructure with Kubernetes, and the jobs don't have to conflict. But flip side of that, with all that, you know, 
with all that power of developers also comes some additional responsibility. And so for a lot of use cases, the developers might find themselves dealing with something that they didn't expect to. Maybe like a big one that comes up is like Kubernetes uh, uh, network configurations to get to some data source that wasn't part of the standard. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to address with our operators. But you know, reality is we're not going to hit every use case out of the park in the first round. <clears throat> you can also, with Kubernetes, you don't have to start thinking. You can go from thinking about things in a cluster level to just a particular job level and assign memory and CPU and resources at that job level, which is great. You can really isolate those, uh, isolate those containers. The flip side to isolation is a lot of times there's data that you do want to share between jobs. Now with the operators, we're going to give you integrations with cloud storage, so you can very easily use like an S3 or a cloud storage as your source or, or your sync, which will help. But there's still a lot of intermediate data, things like shuffle data, things like temp data that occasionally you need to share between jobs, and that can be a little bit more difficult in this more isolated world. And finally, the last one I have here is Kubernetes has a lot of really cool features, especially around security, things like our secret manager, where you can start to drop in you know, JDBC connections, keep those protected for all your different you know, users. But flip side is the security can get a little bit more complicated. It reminds me of like one of those Russian dolls where you have accounts within accounts within accounts, where you have like a VM that's running a service account. Then within that, there's actually a Kubernetes service account. And then with that, you might have like Kerberos principles. So tracking that all the way through can sometimes be a headache for folks. So this is my whirlwind tour of what we're working on here at Google in the open source big data space. Uh, one of our developers on the Flink operator, Dagong, is actually here today. And so we're very interested in working with anybody on these open source operators. Please come talk to me or Dagong or Grizz here if you want to learn more about uh, how to get involved in the community here. Uh, with that, I'm just going to leave some sessions on that we have uh, Google presenting throughout the rest of the week. And thank you all for coming to my session and appreciate the time.